Hi, everybody. Happy Friday. Uh, welcome uh, to the Friday Ambassador Workshop Series in the Hotel Student Leadership Academy with Marley. And um, so we have uh, a great workshop today uh, with uh, a distinguished panel uh, of wonderful leaders from our community. And so I'm excited uh, for you guys to have this experience. Marley's gonna watch the whole thing because she's running for the New York State Senate in 2040. <laughs> there you go. So, um, and then Miles will be behind her a couple of years later. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to our alumnus, our alumni, Philip uh, David Ellison uh, to lead the conversation so that you guys don't have to hear Marley screaming. Uh, so welcome and, and Philip. That'd be great. Um, Jason, thank you so much for the invitation to come back um, to host us, albeit in virtual. I do feel in spirit with you all and I'm very humble to um, be with you. And um, I, I just wanna say, um, you know, thank you to Jason uh, I'd also want to say thank you to the distinguished panel of leaders um, from or, you know, working in New York City. Um, it is also humbling to be able to call and text and email people who are doing the good work and um, have them also believe in a vision where community college students and students as a whole have um, access to civic education um as well as career development it's about investing in our communities and investing in our community college students and so i'm also so thankful for each and every one of the panelists here today um, that i've met and known in varying capacities over some time and i also want to shout out to the alumni and the students who are joining us as you know i see the content connecting to audio um, and another couple quick shout outs i'd like to give before we begin a really, I think, uh, robust, engaging, and exciting conversation, an opportunity to really dig deep and learn, because um, uh, we're all really excited to be here. So uh, Dr. Helen Chang, the political science professor at Hostos, um, uh, very generous with her, her, her time today and sending out to her students in Political Science 101, uh, also to um, Rocio, who is uh, an alumnus and a professor at uh, Hostos Community College. She came back to be at Hostos and what, what a story that is and a representation to, to leave and come back um, and be a part of that community. And to the early high school trial students at Hostos who are also possibly joining us today, I say hello. And lastly, shout out to the, all the leaders of the Student Leadership Academy. We're here together um, to learn and build and grow. So I, I ground this panel Today, this workshop, this conversation, this opportunity, all right, this community is really a politic, what we said was politics 101, a beginner's um, discussion and panel to New York City and New York State government. I think what we do know is that unfortunately, um, civic education is necessary to all levels of our lives. Um, we do not really get a robust full civic education as we grow up in the United States. And uh, democracy, a republic, requires an educated participatory citizenry, right? It means that we, we the people, have to be um, knowing what's going on about the issues affecting our community, but also how do we make change? How do we do our voice? How do we put our voices in, in practice in this system? And we oftentimes do not get the tools to do so, right? And um, part of that also is government politics. You see things on TV or in the paper, or you see maybe see somebody in your community, but we don't know what actually, how it works. What are you doing unless you're engaged with it? And so this is where we say, take the opportunity to demystify that, to, to learn in conversation and dialogue through people who work in government every day. And also uh, uh, to, to make them human, right? Like these people who are on this panel today are a number of folks who went to Hostos a number of folks that went to CUNY, right? And uh, a number of folks who are working in our city and our state government, um, which I believe um, says something about them, says something about what's possible. And it also, it, it, we're here to, to um, be an access point for you all 
uh, these leaders in this community on at Hostos, right? So that you all can see what is possible. And we believe that you can be greater than us, um, right? And so I hope um, you learn. I hope you ask questions. Um, I, and I hope this is worthwhile and meaningful for you and anyone else who watches this recording. So again, I say thank you and excited. Um, let's begin. So I'm just going to introduce, uh, I'm not going to read bios. I think um, these folks can tell you more about themselves than I can. Um, and so to begin the conversation, I will though um, mention um, their names um, and so forth. And uh, I'll allow them in the question to be able to talk about, the, you know, mention their title and who they work for. Um, and everything. So I'll, I'll start and say uh, someone who is a, a proud Hostos alumni who recently won a Hostos award and I think is makes everyone at Hostos really proud. Um, and as I've heard her say, she's a Bronx girl through and through in the borough. Um, Aisha Bravo uh, is here today. Um, uh, Amanda Septimo, which I'm really humbled also to have Amanda here. I've known for years. And um, Amanda, um, you know, a little hint, Amanda will be representing the, the district that Hostos is in. So get familiar for your complaints or for your opportunities to intern and work with her to make Hunts Point and that district even better. Uh, Jimmy Rivera, we have here as well, a Hostos alum, proud Hostos alum. Enoch Asawa, very proud to have Enoch. Enoch and I were in the honors program and all different uh, classes and um, Enoch has come far and gone back and come back to the city to work in government. Uh, also, I'd like to highlight Jordan Stockdale, who I've known uh, for a number of years as well, um, doing tremendous work. And I'm really interested in hearing his perspective of working in government and different uh, positions he's had. And I'm so excited to have one of my colleagues that I work with throughout Harlem that takes my call when I want to ask some questions or shares information or when I send somebody to her that she already knows. Uh, Mina White, also a CUNY uh, alumna, City College. Um, and, and so I'm so glad, Mina, that you could join us, right? So these are some of the people. Uh, I'll start with a simple question. If it's 101, let's, let's begin um, by um, talking about, uh, you know, allow you all, um, we will start with that, um, Aisha, if you could talk about, you know, which, what's your title? You know, what's, who, do you, who do you work for? What institution do you work for? Where are you from? I already kind of gave it out there, but you can even give us a little bit more of like what neighborhood you're from. Uh, and that's the model we can go for the rest of the panelists. And we'll start there and then we'll get into the question around, you know, what is your institution? What do you actually do in that role? What is the institution and why it's important? So let's start with those um, simple questions. Sure. Um, like you said, my name is Aisha Bravo, and I am definitely a proud Bronxite, born and raised. Um, I was born and raised in the Kingsbridge Bedford Park section. I currently live in the Allenville Allenton section. I am the district manager of Bronx Community Board 7. There are 12 community boards in the Bronx, and we're lucky number seven. <laughs> well, I have the honor of representing Community Board 7. Awesome. And we'll just go, I, what I see is Mina. Hi, so my name is Mina White. I'm a constituent community liaison for assembly member Al Taylor. So he's in the 71st assembly district that's upper Manhattan. So that includes um, a small part of Harlem, a large part of Washington Heights. We're talking about West Harlem, uh, Hamilton Heights as well. Um, so basically what I do in this role, uh, constituency, so in an assembly district where it's about you know 130,000 uh, folks that the assembly member represents. Um, I liaison to constituents, I assist them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and as the community is, uh, and as far as community, um, you know, I primarily focus on this Harlem area of the district. Um, just, you know, making sure that constituents are informed, that community boards are informed on the work that he's doing uh, and, you know, just state laws and what's going on and, you know, how we are also engaging the community. Excellent. Uh, Amanda Septimo, could you um, please keep us moving? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Amanda Septimo. I right now am working as a political and community organizer for the labor union that represents a lot of the nurses around New York State. Um, I've done a lot of different things in government over the years, um, and soon I will be transitioning to the state assembly to represent the 84th assembly district, which includes host of um, it includes the Yankee Stadium area, Hunts Point, Port Morris, Mott Haven, 
Um, so if you live in any of those places or are interested in government, I'm definitely happy to be a resource um, and happy to field your complaints um, according to Phil's advice. Um, and thank you all for being here and thanks for having me. Yeah, again, um, congratulations, Amanda. You put so much work in and effort. Um, we're, so, we're so happy for you and the district's excited to have you and, and so is Hostos. Jimmy. Hi everyone, this is um, Jimmy Rivera, born and raised in the Bronx. I still live around 161st Street Yankee Stadium. I am a member of the Bronx Community Board 4, uh, which encompasses um, High Bridge Yankee Stadium, uh, George Kimmer Park, Grand Concourse, and a little bit of 174th Street on the west side. Um, what I do politically, I am currently the vice president of the Stonewall Democrats in New York City is an LGBTQ IA plus um, political club that endorses um, city, state and federal level um, candidates running for office and as well as for president and for governor. Uh, so I am also proud of Hulsa, I'm an alumni at Hulsa Community College. College. I graduated in 2010 when Sonia Sotomayor was the commencer speaker uh, there, uh, alongside with uh, her mother, who graduated from Hostels years ago. And after Hostels, I went to Baruch College uh, and I graduated with a BA degree in political science. Excellent. Thank, thank you, Jimmy. And that's right, pointing out that Sotomayor is a legacy um, at, at Hostels, her mother and herself. And she's often back. And I remember being at Hostels and her being being at her talk and her going around shaking everyone's hand. So it's really, really important. Jordan, please, you can round us out here. Phil, so thanks for inviting me to this wonderful panel. Uh, my name is Jordan Stockdale. I'm the executive director of the Young Men's Initiative. We are a, a mayoral office that focuses on reducing disparities um, and the racial disparities in young people across education, employment, and in the criminal justice system. Excellent, thank you. And I, and I see an alum, Yocasta, who I know has worked in government as well. So thank you for being here and we'll probably engage you as well. And Enoch, I, I believe you're rounding us out in terms of our introductions. Hey everyone, uh, yes, Enoch Soa, Hostos alum, class of 2012. Um, I was born in Ghana, but I was nurtured in New York. Uh, <laughs> Currently, I'm currently a senior investigator at the New York City Civilian Complaints Review Board, which is the largest uh, civilian oversight body uh, that uh, oversees uh, the NYPD. We mostly investigate misconduct complaints against members of the New York uh, the Police Department. Uh, I guess we'll get into more details of that later. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> great. <clears throat> so everyone kind of gave an introduction to themselves. Let's dig a little deeper into your actual role, like who you work for um, or what you work with and, and like what what does that body do? Like tell us if, you know, we have different levels of government here, everything from grassroots volunteer government from community boards, people participating in political clubs um, to the mayor's office and assembly. Tell us a little bit about that office and its function in New York City government, why it's important. And um, a little bit into what you know why why should host of students be understanding the role of this office um and what you do so i'll start here i actually want to start at the ground level here back to aisha just because uh her work with community boards as a district manager great thank you for that so um there are 59 community boards across the city of new york there are 12 in the bronx like i mentioned earlier i'm the district manager for community board seven um, the, I, I like to call community boards live 311. So whatever you call 311 for, that's typically what we handle. So it's three, the way we break it down, it's plan, planning, service delivery, and participation. So I know many of you have heard about rezonings, you know, whether upzoning, downzonings, ULERBs, terms like that. So typically that comes to what we call the grunt level, which is the community board. So the community boards break out into several committees. They can have a land use committee, they can have a housing committee, things of that nature, education. They pretty much align with city agencies and we hold city agencies accountable for service delivery, right? Um, whether it's sanitation services, park services, we work closely with the Department of Education um, to around infrastructural issues, 
Um, and then the last thing I would say is participation, which is a big deal, right? We're like the bridge builder between the community as a whole and city agencies because people call us, like they call the office nine to five um, for us to deliver, to make sure that services are delivered. And then they're addressed on a broader level on the committee. Um, so I would say that that's like the rapid version of a community board, but I'll share the importance of it. Um, if you want to know the infrastructure of what's happening in your community, that's where it happens. When a developer is getting government money to build something, they go to the community board, um, no matter what it is, right? Like if there's going to be a bike lane, they go to the community board, the Department of Transportation. If there is a construction happening in the local school where they're adding an annex, they're coming to the community board. And I think it's a very crucial um, component to government and service delivery to participate because it helps you understand the different levels of government before you go anywhere else, right? Um, I do wanna share that I know community board spaces are a little antiquated and they're not necessarily the most welcoming spaces because you hear terms like, this is what we've always done and things like that. And they kind of turn off um, a different generation. But I have to tell you that um, sometimes we have to go into spaces that we don't feel welcome um, just to make space for others like ourselves, right? And I think that that's important. Um, so I encourage civic participation when it comes to community boards. Um, these are open spaces. These are all public meetings. And um, yeah, that's that's the that's the summary of it. I mean, I, for the sake of time, um, I could def I have a PowerPoint presentation that I have that gets into the nuts and bolts of what a community board is, and I'd be happy to share that if if yeah. if we have a different forum. But if I had to narrow it down, is planning, service delivery, and participation. Yeah, right. I think, you, and we can share resources with. I think it'd be great if we compile. If you have resources you want to share about a democratic club, about a community board about a community organizing group or association like um, NICENAS, we can share those links and people can explore and Jason can send them out and you can explore um, this further, right? This is just a conversation to introduce. This is the 101, y'all got to do the work afterwards and reach out to us if you need help on that. Um, thank you about that. Really, And I really sum that up like community boards, if you need to know what's going on in your community is one app facet you can get tied to your community board and we'll connect you to those community boards so you can figure that out. And that's one introductory way, voluntary positions. And I believe the borough presidents in your community are the ones that can help you get on. Is that yeah. true? Yeah, yes, um, I should have spoken about that. So the borough president uh, um, has jurisdiction of appointing all 50 board, member, uh, 50 board members. Every community board has up to 50 board members, but it depends on geography, right? Like for example, my community board is represented by three council members versus just one. So proportionally, the, gov um, the borough president will appoint up to 25 and leave it up to the discretion of the council member with him having final approval as to who they recommend to compose that 25. So these people become officers of the city of New York and are held to the same standards as the employees in terms of receiving EEO training, sexual harassment policies, um, sensitivity training around the LGBTQA community, things that us as city employees um, receive training for because they are holding um, city agencies accountable and they also um, oversee staff, which is like folks like myself, the district manager and community coordinators. So it's important to participate. I believe that as of right now, that is an open process. So if you go to your respective borough president's website, there's a section in there that says community boards and you'll be able to download the application. And I encourage that even if you don't get in, I encourage that you either participate with a community board, neighborhood advisory board, wherever you can get in. And you don't need to be a member to be civically engaged. And I know that often turns people off, like if they don't get on the board, they try not, they don't go to the meetings. But I think it's important that you're, you create a space for yourself and your neighbors. Yep. And I, I lastly, uh, the two points I say, each of them have committees, education, workforce development, et cetera, things you're interested in. And if you're curious, if you're concerned about the buildings in your, in your community, the developers that's going on, real estate that's coming in, that's those buildings and developers have to come to your community board and you can see what they're, what's going on, how many apartments are affordable and learn what the affordability rate is. And you can push on that, right? And so I, that's, that's clear. I'll take a step back and go to Jimmy. Uh, Jimmy, you've been a part of Democratic clubs. You are, you are vice president of one. Tell, tell us a little bit about the, the, the Democratic club scene and, and yours and why that's important. So yes, thank you, um, Phil. So we, so in the, in the United States, Obviously, in every state, every local state has a political club. 
So in New York City, each borough has its own small version of the club, Democratic club, uh, progressive, more DSA clubs, and, and so forth. So um, I'm currently the vice president of Stonewall Democrats. So what we do um, as a club, we, like I said, we endorse candidates for city council, for mayor, for the controller, for governor of New York, for board presidents. Now that the elections for city council is next year, about like 80% of the current um, elected officials in the city council, as well as the mayor, as well as controller and borough presidents will be termed out. And so um, what we do collectively, we come as a group, we talk about the candidates itself. And then like Aisha said about committee boards, this is an open club to everyone to come in and to join the conversation. If there's an issue um, that you can bring up that, that involves the LGBTQ community, if it's like, like harassment from the NYPD or is it from um, like deny on like health access, we can help further policies in political clubs. And so that's what we do mainly is just fundraising, endorsement. We also organize. We, before COVID, we would go to different states. Uh, we would go at, during the, let me give an example, um, during the 2016 presidency, we would have buses going to New York, to Pennsylvania, or, you know, back and forth to have people learn, learn how to canvas and door knock for candidates running for office. The same goes in New York City. Uh, we will tell you, hey, we endorse this, can we endorse, for example, we, we endorse Phillips for um, city council. Mm -hmm. And so we would like to have maybe like five people, maybe six people to knock on doors. Um, we will actually help you and train you how to persuade voters to endorse Phil for, for city council. And so that's what we do most of the time, but whenever we come into, into protest uh, with like Black Lives Matter or with Trans Lives Matter, uh, we always on the front lines of issues regarding the LGBTQI plus community. And that representation is really important. It's a powerful club and representative club that you're a part of that you've been pushing um, and representing very well. Um, so Jimmy, I'm so glad that um, you could be here and share that, right? So on the ground, we've got the political club and um, the Democratic right, the Democratic club, um, right? As a source of where you can go and start and meet some other people who can help you understand what's going on and you can meet candidates. Candidates are gonna be coming to these, right? So who's, who's running is gonna come in your neighborhood to that club. It's a way to get to meet them at a, and not have so much stress about it. Or your community board is less political in that explicit way, but is very involved in your career. Um, actually, Jimmy, I want to come back to you for a moment. You worked in the city council, right? We'll get into a little bit on your trajectory, but could you talk about uh, working in the city council? Like really what, what the city council is and its function in the city? Well, I was an intern in the city council. Um, I was an intern for... Council member Carlos Menchaca, who's currently running for mayor. I also was an intern one last time for um, Danny Drum, council member Danny Drum, who represents parts of Queens and Jackson Heights. Both um, elected officials are LGBTQ. And so what I did as my role as an intern and even afterwards is constituent service, um, ser constituent services. I think someone mentions about constituent services, like complaints. And so like constituents would come into the door and they would tell you, I have, a, have an issue with my landlord. Uh, you know, I can't pay this rent or I can't apply for, how can I apply for food stamps? So it's, it's just cases of everyday life, everyday day life. And so they can be very small or it can be very something very big. Um, it, was, it was great I mean, to, to be able to learn about the functions of city council. Budgets, you know, budgets is always a headache. When I was an intern from on Danny Drum, I learned about participatory budgeting and that function, how people in the community have a voice to vote on a particular project. And it could be like having a, a, a street light, having like a new playground for the for the children, or like like nice gardening in in the park. So that was really great to learn about participatory budgeting. Um, in a sense, and, but 
in, 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 you know, city council is, is huge. <laughs> has like a lot of procedures, a lot of laws, a lot of um, things that you sort of need to manage. Mm -hmm. And so, but you know, it's, it's like a sort of step by step mm -hmm. um, to learn about them. And, and it's, to be honest, if anyone is interested in interning, you know, right now, right now everything's virtual. Next year, they're probably gonna they're gonna hire like uh, some like interns in the fall and spring and summer. So you know, look at look up your council members if you're interested in a particular role. If you're interested in health, uh, Danny John is the chair of the health committee. If you're interested in immigration, like Carlos Rinchak is the chair of the immigration um, committee. So look at uh, like I would do research on certain council members and what is their role and what are your spot your interests. Sure, sure. And, I, and I, thank you, Jimmy. And I'll add a little bit more very briefly here. The New York City Council is a lawmaking body, right? So they pass laws, but really they are also a check on the mayor, right? Between the mayor of New York City and the, this council model, um, they serve as a, a check. Now there's 51 members of the city council in New York City. That's 51 council districts. So you live in a council district and you have a city council member, right? And so um, they're also responsible for the budget. Jimmy touched on it, the budget of New York City, right? When law laws getting passed, but also laws that have funding tied to them, which is a larger conversation. Uh, but so they pass the budget and there's a negotiation between the mayor and the city council to get this budget approved, right? And we're dealing with some tough times in terms of the budget of the state and the city. We can talk about that with COVID and taxes, but um, that giving you that. There is a city council speaker there's a speaker of the city council, right? That person who works with the mayor, it represents the voice of the city council, has a central staff. And the speaker of the city council is Corey Johnson at the moment. And so there's a there's this, this so there's working for a city council person and their office and their legislation doing work in the and there's also a city council speaker who has his own staff, a little bit bigger than everyone else's. And he it's called central staff. Um, and there's a number of committees, like Jimmy mentioned, around themes like uh issues like immigration, education, land use, how land is being used, real estate development, you know, those things, committees. So um, just wanted to make sure you all understood that. I'd love to go, we talk about city council. I'd like to go talk about the mayor's office. And Jordan, could you talk a little bit about the, the mayor's office and, um, you know, your your title and, and what, what's the, why is the, what's the important, of, why is the mayor of New York City play a fundamental important role? Yeah, uh, so, uh, I work in the mayor's office under Deputy Mayor Thompson, who's the Deputy Mayor for Strategic Initiatives. Um, you know, the mayor's office plays a fundamental role in uh, devising policy and implementing policy and implementing programs. Um, so, you know, there's a lot there. <laughs> there's a lot that the Young Men's Initiative does. And I'm happy, happy to get into those things. Um, Phil, just let me know, like, give me a little more specific question, if you will. Yeah, well, what's what's the mayor? The mayor is the executive of the city. What's what's the what's the role of that of the mayor and um, and I me? Mean, just to, you know, briefly, the deputy mayor. You gave the example of Phil Thompson. Any other deputy mayor that that you think plays an important role and uh, in relationship to a government agency? Just just a little bit breakdown of of that for like maybe a minute and a half, two minutes. So the the mayor oversees the Department of Education, the you know NYPD, ACS. Uh, the Administration for Children's Services, all the, all the major agencies in the city. Um, and we are but a small agency. So the, the budget of, of New York is about $90 billion. Uh, so it's a huge budget. Uh, of that budget, the Young Men's Initiative is $32 million. So we are a small piece of the pie, uh, but we are able to leverage that funding to do a lot. And, and I'm happy to talk about that. Talking about the the what the mayor does in, in the entire mayor's office is a little hard for me because it's it's like all city government, mm -hmm. and I don't know how to break that down right now. Tell, uh, tell me a little bit about your role in the mayor's office. Huh? Yeah, so we uh, the Young Men's Initiative we fund and co manage and co manage initiatives across workforce development, across uh, mentoring and education and criminal justice reform. So one of our most popular initiatives is New York City Men Teach, which is a program that's designed to increase the number of men of color in the classroom. Uh, and it's one of the most comprehensive programs in the nation that, that does that work. And it's been responsible for you know, uh, hundreds of additional men of color in the classroom. 
Why is that important? Well, we know from data that when people can see themselves uh, in their teachers and see themselves in positions of success, they're more likely to believe in themselves and to be successful. And so having more positive male role models in the classroom is part and parcel to ensuring that our kids believe in themselves. Uh, we also have a program uh, uh, with CCRB. I see Enoch on here, so I wanna, I wanna uh, talk about that that we recently launched, which is CCRB's first public education campaign, uh, where we're going to have uh, radio advertisements telling New Yorkers, this is what the CCRB does. Uh, this is when and how to contact them. Uh, they, they actually never had a uh, public campaign with financing uh, in their 26 year history. So this is the first time and CCRB and YMI got together to do that. We're also gonna train thousands of young New Yorkers on uh, when and how to contact CCRB by paying youth educators. So it's gonna be a peer-to-peer -peer education model uh, where young people that we pay will go to different community-based organizations, we'll go to churches, we'll go to schools and say, this is what the CCRB is and this is what they do. Uh, so really excited about that. Uh, we also recently launched the Mentors Matter Initiative, which has three components. The first is uh, a pretty big contract with 100 black men to tutor uh, and mentor students uh, DOE students. So they're going to mentor hundreds of students this school year. Uh, we're also paying CUNY students to tutor DOE students, uh, which is uh, through CUNY Tutor Corps. And then lastly, we just issued $500,000 in uh, grants to community-based organizations that offer tutoring, mentoring, or social emotional support uh, to DOE students. Uh, and so 25 different community-based organizations, 11 of them are in the Bronx. Uh, won those awards and are going to begin you know, tutoring our kids soon. So really excited about all those initiatives. And that's a little bit about what uh, YMI does. Jordan, thank you for that breakdown of the Young Men's Initiative and your role in mayor's office. Um, Jordan was also deputy executive director of Close Rikers, and he, he'll maybe have a chance to get into that a little bit later. He's He's got an interesting path in the mayor's office, but uh, right, the mayor is the executive of the city, and he has a number of agencies at his disposal that are doing services for New Yorkers and making sure the city runs, right? He, it's the administrative leader of the city, the strategy and how do you meet New Yorkers, a lot on the shoulders of a, of a mayor on, uh, 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 for a global city like New York. Um, uh, so, and a lot of opportunities there. And lastly, um, with Jordan, he heard CUNY Corps, a way to get paid to be doing good work, helping out students, right? In this pandemic. So there, there's an opportunities there. Um, we can come back to Jordan and try to hold him accountable for host, host those spots. Um, try to see host of students getting paid. No, I'm done playing, but not really. Um, you brought up, uh, you brought up uh, the CCRB, and I'm going to get to the folks at the top there in a moment um, to our esteemed guests up top, but I'm going to go to CCRB because um, in this moment where we've had, uh, well, I'm going to ask a little bit later, we've had Black Lives Matters, we've had um, this pandemic, you know, we've been thinking about policing, whether that be de defunding or redefining public safety and what's the role of policing. How do we hold um, uh, policing accountable to our communities? And, and uh, we just also lost a major historical figure in New York City, Mayor David Dinkins, um, the first black mayor, African-American mayor of New York City, who really uh, played a huge role in CCRB and where it's at today. And most people don't know what it is, like Jordan said. So Enoch, could you talk a little bit about CCRB and why is why is CCRB why sh, why is Jordan's organization the mayor's office helping collaborate and give funding to CCRB for people to know what it is? It must be play an important function. So tell us a little about that. Right. Thank you, Phil, and hello, everyone. So um, as I mentioned earlier on in my brief intro, so the uh, the New York City Civilian Complaint Review Board is the uh, oversight, the civilian oversight body of the NYPD. So um, as most of you know, the NYPD is basically the largest police force in the country. Um, and so we act as the civilian watchdog agency. Uh, the uh, agency, as Phil and Jordan indicated, was established about 26 years ago. <clears throat> Excuse me, but most people don't know about it. Um, and our mandate mostly just covers uh, four areas. So in, uh, issues regarding uh, the use of force. So police interactions that where officers use force, interactions where officers, uh, we abuse of authority. So issues that go uh, to, you know, Fourth Amendment issues, stop, frisk, uh, threats, 
Uh, we just included sexual misconduct to our mandate. And so that's something that we also investigate. Uh, there are also issues of uh, discourtesy. Uh, I mean, if you look at almost every police vehicle, you see the CPR, courtesy, professionalism, respect. And so we expect them, officers doing their interactions with civilians to uh, honor that code. And so you know, officers generally should be using profanity or speaking to people in a uh, derogatory manner uh, and offensive remarks as well. So making statements that, you know, imbibe on people's gender, uh, sexual orientation and the likes of that. So those are the four key mandates that the agency handles. And we kind of go through it in, in two phases. So we have an investigative phase, uh, which is the agency, uh, the unit that I'm in. And what's mostly what we do is we investigate these actions when we get a complaint from a civilian. Uh, the complaint process is fairly simple. It could be, you could file a complaint on behalf of yourself if you had an interaction with a police officer and you felt that, you know, your rights were violated or you felt that something was not right. You could, uh, you could call a hotline. We have uh, intake uh, personnel who are there to take your complaint. You could also do it online. You could also call 311 and file the complaint and then they would refer it to us. Once we get a complaint, it will be assigned to an investigator who will then reach out to you or whoever it is. Or oh, one thing I forgot to mention, you, you can also file a complaint even if you were not a witness to it. So uh, if you see an incident on Twitter, uh, Facebook, YouTube, and you feel like, oh, this is some egregious thing that has to be looked at, you could always file a complaint as well. Uh, once we get it, uh, an investigator is assigned to it. That investigator will try to identify uh, uh, the complainer, the victim in that case, get a statement from them. Um, and like I said, we have two ways that we handle it. There are certain complaints uh, that we, based on our own, uh, our own mechanisms, are able to determine whether or not that complaint is good for mediation. Uh, the, the overarching scheme of, uh, of CCRB, although it's to investigate and make sure that our officers are disciplined for misconduct, is also to build trust. And so we have a unit that basically deals with mediation where you basically, as a complainant, as a victim, you could actually meet the officer in question that you had that interaction with in the presence of someone who is uh, very neutral and that go, the job of that person is basically to facilitate a conversation. Um, and the reason why we have, uh, we brought up, we had this mediation program is, as we most of us know, the power balance on doing street interactions are a little bit different, but once you come in during the mediation session, there's that flip where you as a civilian, basically as a taxpayer, get to question the officer directly about the, that interaction. Um, and so that's uh, one aspect, our mediation aspect. Investigation mostly deals with making sure that the officer gets disciplined for their actions. Um, we have, well, we just, the, the agency is governed by a 15 panel board, uh, five are chosen by city council, one representing each borough, five are appointed by the mayor, including the chair of the board, um, and then three are selected by the police commissioner. And then just recently, we added two new uh, board positions. One is going to be appointed by the Public Advocates Office, and then one is going to be a joint mayor and city council uh, nominee. So ma it, making sure it's a very de uh, deliberative process. Uh, I guess the reason why having the CCRB is important, I, I think, is cannot be overstated in that the goal is that we want to make sure that officers are doing the right thing. We want to make sure that there is that oversight watchdog agency that is looking into the actions of police officers and most importantly to build trust among uh, police officers in the communities that they serve. It's one thing to have police officers have your own internal review systems but have no but them knowing that there is an outside agency that overlooks them and makes sure and that is also going to be making recommendations for disciplinary actions um, at least puts them on their toes uh, and gives uh, most especially New Yorkers the confidence to know that you know as you know, misconduct, misconduct against, against citizens are not going to be overlooked and are not going to be, you know, are not going to be looked into. And so that has been the core mandate of the CCRB. And I, I mean, as time goes on, we could get into the more specifics of it. But generally, it's there to be as that to be that watchdog agency of, of, over the NYPD and to make sure that there's trust and people are doing the right thing. Enoch, I appreciate that. Um... CCRB is a little bit different than every other government agency, as he said, in the city um, from its appoint, how it's appointed, but not role, right? It's a watchdog. Um, if you experience police violence or brutality, or you see other people, right now we have our phones, we have other reasons, but sometimes the power balance is it's unsafe, you know, and so CCRB is a way that you can investigate 
or hold police accountable. It's one tool. And I'm sure most people do not know CCRB. So thank you mm -hmm. for what you do there. Um, and so I'm going to bring it up top to um, uh, up top here. I know um, Mina, I'm, I'm going to bring, I'm going to round out some of this with the two of you here in dialogue. And you, Mina, you talked a little bit about your, excuse me, your role as a community and constituent liaison. Um, uh, could you, um, you also worked in legislation, I guess for you and a man uh, as, as um, maybe you could talk about a little bit about the assembly. What's the role of the assembly in the state Senate? What's the role of the state legislature? So I know um, you maybe Mina, you could just take a moment to kind of talk about what you see, you see as the role of the state legislature. And then Amanda, someone who's entering could give her perspective on that as well. Yeah, so um, like Jimmy uh, was saying, um, I primarily, uh, similarly, I primarily deal with um, the day to day. So the constituent complaints and those issues. However, um, how I like to describe it, because again, what this question is going back to is our lack of civic engagement um, and civic education uh, here in New York City and just the state in general. Um, but how I like to explain it is that basically, you know, we all know Congress and we all know the US Senate, we all know pretty much Chuck Schumer. Um, so basically, the assembly is our state's. Um, House of Representatives, our state's Congress. So we are the lower uh, level of the state legislator. And then above that is the Senate, um, New York State Senate, US Senate, um, same thing. So when uh, bills are passed, uh, when bills um, you know, are going through the assembly, uh, they have to go through the Senate. It cannot become a law if it does not go through the Senate. Um, so the assembly has 150 members. Uh, the Senate has less, it's only 63. Um, however, uh, what was so great about 2018 is that uh, the Senate was finally uh, had a democratic majority. So all of these great legislative um, bills and packages that we've seen passed, especially during the summer, um, we've spoken about CCRB, so when we're talking about police reform, um, that could not have been passed if we did not have a Senate majority that was Democratic. Um, so, that's great. yeah, that's that's the gist of it. Um, please uh, yeah. go ahead. No, that's, and that's, yeah. that's really good. And I think you said that, um, and you and your community, you work on the day to day on, with constituents. Constituents have problems and issues, and they come to your office and they have faith and you sit down with them and you work with them on their, pro you help them. Like, you know, you just take up, like take 30 seconds here to say, well, what do you, a constituent comes to your office. What do you, what do you do? You know, if, if someone, if one of these hostel students was in your district and they can in Harlem and upper, upper Manhattan, and Washington, they come to you with an issue. What goes on from there really quickly? Uh, it depends. Um, a lot of the issues they, they're, they range from benefits issues. So, hey, I don't know why SNAP cut me off, food stamps cut me off, what's going on? Um, reaching out to, we actually do a lot of um, reaching out to city agencies, even though we are a state um, representative of a body in office, uh, but we are in New York City and a lot of, you know, the support, a lot of our services are um, majority city-based. Uh, so I'm reaching out to HRA, finding out, you know, through our government representative, because there are governmental, intergovernmental representatives within each agency. Um, I have this constituent, this is their case number, can you look into this for me? And then um, they tell me, you know, where to go, you either need to reapply, or hey, this is cool, um, she's going to go through, and we're able to just, you know, get that issue resolved uh, through our contacts. Um, and also ranges from housing. Um, going back to three and one complaints. Uh, if a landlord is not being responsive to a constituent's uh, complaints, um, we definitely ask them to uh, record their complaints. So call through and one and then we follow up uh, again with, we will follow up with a letter. Um, if that doesn't go through, you know, uh, we sometimes do ask uh, to and assist them with getting legal representation and we write letters on their behalf so that they do receive that. Excellent, right? So that's that's the back end, right? You have an yeah, issue that's, in your community. We don't hear so often, but hear. that's what that looks like that's in the that, office. That's what that looks like. I think that's really important for people to understand. Like, if, why if I'm going to you, if I have a problem, what can you do for me, and how does that work, right? And you sit down and you hear people's stories, and then you're working. Government is big, you know. Government 
is, uh, is massive. If you think about all of these things connected and they have to have people who are in touch with each other. So, right. So Mina, like Mina said, she's then her team is getting in contact with an agency and working with the agency to try to solve or alleviate that problem. And there's a lot of communication between, there has to be communication between the mayor's office, the agency, the elected official, the community board, um, the different, so we're all, we have to speak to each other, um, you know, and that's really actually important. Intergovernmental relations is what we call that um, and collaboration. And so then we'll go round out way here with Amanda, um, you know, our, our assembly elect here. And Amanda, Amanda has a wide range of experience. So Amanda has worked in Congress in, in, in the community in this district. And so Amanda can talk about the federal level of like what Congress is and what she did uh, working with the Congress member, the story, the historic Congress member, um, Jose Serrano, who just um, exited Congress after a number of years on um, Richie Torres, the city councilman, now is going to be hostesses in the district's um, uh, city congressman in Washington, DC. So talk a little bit about your, you know, Congress, just really briefly role of Congress. What did you do there? And then of, of course, if you have any insight into the assembly and, and uh, the governor's office, like if you could in like two minutes or so, two, three minutes. Sure. Um, so I think that um, first, before I get into kind of the details of how Congress works and what you do there, um, I wanna point out that I actually interned for Congressman Toronto when I was in high school. For two years. Um, and at the time, they weren't even accepting high school interns. I just wanted to really have an opportunity to spend time in the office. Um, and they saw that I had some energy and really wanted to be helpful. And they made space for me. And I went on to intern there for about two years, my last two years in high school. And then I went away to college, I came back and they had an opening um, on the staff and I took the job and kind of the rest is history. Um, but I love to tell that story because I think one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that almost every government office is very overwhelmed and can always use more help. Um, and so if you are expressing energy and interest and just willingness to help and willingness to be responsible and contribute to the office, they will find a space for you. Um, and so I really encourage everyone to just like take the deep breath and, and jump in um, and find a place because people will make space for you. I will be sort of getting my office up and going in January. So the, the offer certainly still stands for us. Um, and so once I, I was working in Congress, I began as a community liaison, um, which is really someone who kind of serves as the liaison between everything that's happening in the office and what's happening on the ground. And we really use what the information about what was happening in the community to inform the work happening down in DC legislatively. Um, and that was a really incredible experience. Um, it was, it is go, 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 go. I think everyone here who's worked for government will tell you that there's never enough hours in the day um, and there's always more work to do. And um, that was certainly true then. And after about a year, um, just under a year and a half of doing that, I got promoted to district director in the office, um, which was an incredible experience because I was 23 at the time when it happened. Um, and it was a big job, um, but it was really an opportunity to kind of rise to have talent meet um, the occasion. And that I, I'm really grateful for the opportunity. And, and I guess that's my other sort of small nugget is not to limit yourself to the opportunities that you think you can do. Um, half of life is, is getting there and making it so that you let your talent shine and you let your talent rise to meet the opportunities that are in front of you. Um, and so much of that happens in government. Um, it's always just putting your best foot forward because you're around so many people. Phil explained um, that he and I have known each other for many years in a totally different space and we intersect in government all the time um, as is the same case for myself and a few other people on this panel. And so. Um, always working to kind of put your best foot forward because there's opportunities all around you and there's certainly people who want to uplift you um, all at the same time. Amanda, thank you. And I, I just want to highlight that is the reason why she is going to be your next assembly person uh, very shortly, right? As she tied in different nuggets and, I, and, and because of time and I'll be mindful of people's time, we have like another 20 minutes or so. Um, people are you know, putting nuggets in there, tying nuggets in there of advice and just insight and lessons. And we'll make sure we do that as we, we round out um, this panel. These folks will stay on for a moment. There will be additional time if anyone wants to stay on for a couple more minutes, but I also don't, it's okay if you don't because the time um, around 4.40, 4.45 was what we what we agreed um, agreed upon. Thank you, Amanda, um, for, for that. And I'll round out, um, so I, I work at the Office of the Public Advocate of New York City. 
um, you have the mayor, you have the public advocate, and thirdly, you have the comptroller. The comptroller deals with, these, these are the three city executive leaders, right? The mayor you've heard is the executive, the administrative leader of the city. The comptroller deals with the accounting and the budget, uh, has a huge staff to do that actually, you know, and is doing research and data and uh, looking at programs, looking at accounts and contracts and the money. Uh, and the public advocate is a position that started in the night, late eight, 1980s um, when there was a charter revision. The charter of the New York, for, you know, you, this is all research you can do, host those folks, but the charter gives, the, outlines the powers and functions of government. And in that, in 1987, there was a change in a reform and um, the public advocate's office was born. And it's really what, uh, it's supposed to be a watchdog on the mayor and the local government. So it's supposed to hold the mayor, work with the mayor at times, absolutely, but also hold, supposed to hold the mayor accountable, right? As well as hold the local government agencies accountable, right? We also um, are connecting um, constituents to resources. We also do this constituent work. We have a great team at the Public Advocates Office. You go look at the website. And um, right, so we are helping people navigate government as well to get their resources or, and we're giving, helping them give resources. Uh, and I, I, we also have legislative power. So the public advocate, it kind of oversees the city council. They, they, he or she, or they, when we have um, that time, um, can put in, uh, can they can, um, how should we say, we can submit legislation bills into the city council, right, local law, um, but they, we don't have the power to vote on them. So there are a number of bills and then we would work with another city council person or so forth um, uh, and pass that. Um, Jamani Williams is the pub public advocate, a former housing advocate and activist and from Brooklyn, um, who was a city councilman and kind of a leader on criminal justice reform in the city council. So a lot of the things around stop and frisk, ban the box, things around policing, criminal justice that people, folks care about was what he did in the city council before becoming public advocate this last year um, to, to um, fill in uh, for Tish James, the last public advocate, who's now the first um, black woman to be attorney general of the state. And I would say a quick you know, round out in saying that is the office is very unique. There are certain limitations, but there is a lot of power in many ways too. The public advocate um, has the media, right? The media bullpit, like the media looks to the public advocate. He talks, they listen, they come to him. And so our office and mission, we have a mission to elevate the stories of the low income and marginalized in the city. When the mayor is not talking about a certain community, we are uh, we are working with them and organizing or getting touch point and the public advocate is mentioning them, right? We have our watch list of the worst landlords in New York City. And I use that as an example, that's gonna be released next week for everyone looking at the 100 worst landlords, helping the, as a tool that for folks to, to organize and use that. But last time that we launched it last year, the public advocate took two tenants on TV, on the news, about what in NYCHA, about what was not getting fixed in their building. The next day with the media pressure and stories getting out there, they were fixing that building, right? And so we think about the marginalized, we think about the forgotten, we, and we push that. And I'm very proud to work in that office. I'm the Manhattan Borough Advocate. I think all things community affairs, um, everything from you know getting and bringing information in, get, taking information out, um, I'm also building partnerships with uh, advocates. So some of the Black Lives Matters advocates that have come about in this last summer who are doing things like they've, I, I'm working with them and bring them into my office with the right people to figure out how do I push the ball forward to, you know, to get these things past the vision that they see for equity. Um, I'm also building um, uh, relationships with different folks in government, uh, community organizations. Um, I'm working on initiatives in, in Manhattan, like strategic campaigns and citywide. And I'm, lastly, I would say a nugget I'll drop and I'll end here um, is with, with Amanda said of lesson learned. I walked into that office um, really passionate about the ways that technology is impacting black and brown uh, people. And it was not one of our issues, right? The, we're in the 21st century, the digital civil rights, surveillance, all these things impact us, not just your Facebook, not just Amazon and the ways that, you know, it's actually there's tech tool technology that is impacting um, our, our livelihood or even entering our buildings or ICE and tracking and surveilling people. And so I said, we need to do that. And they, they said yes. And I pushed a little bit and found people in government. You can't do anything alone. I'm just going to adopt this legacy. You have to build relationships with other people in your office and other allies and figure out and work together to push, you know, not to say push, but to elevate things. Right. And so I am also now the liaison to the technology data and development team. So I bridge community affairs, um, technology for good, 
or um, technology to help technology for folks on the ground, like community fridges. So I, I built that. So you have to put your, like Amanda said, put your step forward. You have to advocate for yourself and for your community when you get in the door in government, right? And build relationships, 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 relationships. All right, so that, that first part, I think we took a lot of time, but I think it actually was really important to understand the functions and the roles and what, what does it fit in? You guys now understand a lot of the, the you know, the governor is the executive of the state, pass bills, um, regularly, you know, hold bills accountable, hold, hold folks accountable to these bills and veto bills like legislation. And he's kind of like the president of the state, so to speak, and works with the body that Amanda is entering um, to get to work on legislation and get it passed, right? So you now have seen everything here. I, um, I want to I want to move into the start. So some of the nuggets and how people started and be, be strategic here um, and so forth. Actually, I think it's interesting. Jordan, tell me a little bit about how you started in government and, and why did you why and like, why did you move into government? Um, and just give us a little bit about what, how you got into government. Yeah, so uh, I started out as a teacher, a special education teacher in East Harlem 10 years ago, uh, James Walden Johnson. Uh, from there, I really loved teaching, you know, the impact you're able to have on kids and uh, to see their growth every day. It's kind of amazing. Uh, and, and, but I realized that I wanted to have a more macro impact um, and that, you know, I, I worried about what the kids did after school and after they left my class for the year. And so I went to policy school. Uh, and then in policy school, I met a mentor who uh, really, really helped me out. So he was on a panel talking about trying to end mass incarceration. His name is Vinny Shiraldi. And I went up to him after the panel and I said, hey man, do you need someone to work for you? Cause I would love to intern for you. And he was like, actually, yes, yes I do. And he had just uh, became the senior advisor to the mayor's office of criminal justice. Um, and prior to that was the uh, commissioner of probation under Bloomberg. And the de Blasio administration, he had this new position and he had zero staff. So I became his only staff person uh, for a whole year and he poured a lot into me and introduced me to a lot of people. Um, and so I started out at the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice as a graduate fellow, then was hired on as an assistant uh, program director, then turned into a program director where I worked on school climate and safety reform and increasing restorative justice, reducing the number of kids who get arrested in schools. Um, and then I went to the first deputy mayor's office to work for him on education policy. Uh, then I went back to Mock J as the deputy director for Close Rikers, uh, and now I'm in this current role at the Young Men's Initiative. So that's uh, my trajectory in government. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I and I try to and you did mention the full out name, but I know sometimes people hear acronyms um, like Mock J. It's like the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. He did mention it, but try, let's try to use the names uh, just so people understand. They get used to it. maybe they've never heard the, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Yeah, I just want to echo a point that Amanda said, um, government is all about connections. And so it's connecting ideas, it's connecting, um, but it's really connecting to people. And the way that you solve a lot of problems and issues is through convening people, collaborating with folks, and then being able to, you know, to call upon that res uh, um, the relationship to help you solve an issue uh, for the benefit of your constituents, right? And so one of the things I've done since I've been at the mayor's office is I've gotten coffee with one new person a week. And you, you do that and it really, you know, you build your network and you build people that you know and, and you build a knowledge base of just, you know, who's moving around the city and what they're doing. And so I, I think that's just a really good strategy uh, if you're considering a career in government. Thank you for those nuggets. That's, that's amazing, that's beautiful. Um, I actually want to take just like, you know, 30 seconds, I think, Jimmy, just because these students, we, you talked about your entry in terms of interning in city council, but just could talk about your trajectory, I think, actually, because students are going to be going to maybe a four-year program next. I know you said, person we talked, you said you were going to be um, a major, and you switched to political science, start interning. Just what was that like for you, if you could take just one minute and just talk about that? Because I think that's relative to students as they figure out what major they want to be and that where they end up still in government. So, uh, thank you. So when I graduated from hostels, I was interested in accounting. I wanted to become an accountant, an accountant, have my own business and, and so forth. So I went to Baruch College. And so, you know, I don't know what happened that I was like, you know, maybe accounting isn't for me. And so I switched my major to journalism and I figured, oh, maybe I can write some articles 
in the publications or, or newsworthy publications. And so I, I remember when it actually changed for me to political science at the time when the, the Gang of Eight, the Gang of Eight is the eight senators, US senators, Republicans and Democrats, introduced a bill, the Immigration Reform Bill in 2011, I believe. And so I had an assignment to interview the pro-immigrant advocates and the anti-immigrant advocates at a rally at Union Square. And so I have sort of a, what is it called? Those mic, those recording Recorder. tapes, recorders. And I was interviewing people, getting the title, their name. And then that's when it sparked interviewing the anti-immigrant immigrant advocates that they didn't like the immigration reform and they didn't want black, I mean, brown people, all skin types to be in to get citizenship. So I'm there with the recorder and I see this woman saying all these, these things, these words in front of my face, meaning I'm a brown person, as well as um, my parents are from immigrants from Mexico. And so I, the next day, the next two days later, as I gave my professor the article that I completed the assignment, and I asked her, you know, I told her, you know what? I don't think journalism is for me. I don't think, I don't wanna be, I wanna be an outspoken person. I just don't like how this woman said that to me. Um, and I just said, being a reporter, you, you, just have, you just have to have your emotions to yourself, you know? And, and, and if you wanna switch your major, you can. And she suggested political science. And so I then, my first political science class at Baruch was social welfare policy. Uh, it was Professor John G. Robinson, I still remember his name, at Baruch. Um, he talked about healthcare policies. He talked about the, the poverty level of history in the in United States, especially in New York City. Um, just, you know, just a little bit. At the time, um, Barack, former President Barack Obama introduced the, the Obamacare at that time, and he told all the students that from here now, yes, is law. However, that you will see a lot of lawsuits of this of this Obamacare, and you see a lot of the the left, a lot of the, the right, the Republicans, don't like this bill, and you see a lot of lawsuits even go to the Supreme Court. Yeah. Two years later, it was in the Supreme Court, and, and he was right. And and ever since then, I sparked interest in political science. And then one last thing. I was looking for an internship and I, you know, I just like Amanda, I was looking for an internship in politics and I decided to enter for Congresswoman Nadia Velasquez in Brooklyn. And so I met her, I met Nadia on the first day, actually second day. And the, my supervisor said, do you wanna come and say hi to her? And I said, oh, okay, I'm, yeah, I'm good. You know, nice shirt and pants, you know, the Congresswoman. And the thing is that, that I saw that I was entering her room, her office, a small cubicle office, and all I see was she was putting on makeup. And I was like, you know, she's human. She's every human, everyone, you know, whatever she, you know, everyone does that. And, um, and then she said, hi, my name is Jimmy. I'm from the Bronx. I'm here to intern at your office. And then she said, Jimmy, you're gonna have so much fun here. So much fun here. You don't learn a lot. And, and, and it's true, I learned about constituent services. Uh, what I'll say about internships, um, I'll say that apply as, as many offices as you can in city council, in the assembly, in federal. Don't feel like they don't contact you back. Um, there's a lot of times they don't call you, they don't call you or, or give you a call. You just have to push yourself and say, let me give them a call and see what's, what's going on. Just push them and, and say that you spark interest and you'll see it, it will come around. No, it's great. Uh, tying that in about being persistent, the value of it, relationships, the value of sitting down or reaching out, emailing people, calling them, listening, telling your story. Life is about storytelling. Politics is about storytelling. Amanda has a tell a story about who she is or her constituents. Aisha has a tell a story about who she is and her constituents. And those two folks have run for office. I hope we can get into that. I do wanna take a question from the audience, but uh, Aisha has to deal with storytelling. You have to deal with storytelling. 
um, Enoch is listening to stories about the brutality. Imina, so storytelling, these the internships, relationships, all very important. And you putting yourself out there for yourself or your constituents, all themes here. But I want to touch on the internships really quickly to tie in Mina and Enoch, right? Put you in dialogue really quickly around internships because I, in Europe stories, I believe y'all were able, you know, sometimes internships are not paid. I know we have first generation and other students and sometimes that's hard. Maybe you can afford to do a day or two, right? Or, uh, or help out. If you can, you, it helps you get ahead, but that's not always possible. So Mina, I think you and Enoch did programs I think while you were in college or afterwards. So could you just explain the programs that you two did that were the internships, I think that paid you or gave you experience or relationship. Just tell, talk about those two so people know what it is and maybe they can do them. Yeah, um, so, and I, uh, I just also wanna piggyback off what Amanda was saying as well. Um, and everyone was saying, um, just the importance of relationships. Relationships is not only important after you graduate and you're trying to find a job um, or just because you wanna work in government. It's 24 seven, it's, uh, it's necessary in everything that you do. Um, so the program that Philip is referring to is the Edward T. Rogowski, um program and fellowship. So that's how I got involved in this, but I would not have been, um, I would not have been, you know, uh, given that information if I did not have great relationships with my professors. Uh, I was also a CUNY fellow for, um, again, I graduated from City College, so they had a fellowship um, called uh, Partners for Change Fellowship. So if I had not gotten involved in uh, that fellowship program, I probably wouldn't have known that either. So, you know, network with your professors, uh, use their their office time um, so that they can give you reasons. Say, hey, you know, I know you, I know your interests. Uh, please uh, apply to this, et cetera, et cetera. So um, fortunately, the Edward T. Rogowski, this is open to all CUNY students. Um, it is paid. Uh, so it's, you spend, you know, a year, less than a year um, in a Black, Puerto Rican, Asian, Hispanic Caucus uh, member's office. So they, that is um, the Black, Puerto Rican, Asian Caucus is in the city council, as well as in uh, the assembly and the Senate. So basically, it's just in the name. Uh, <laughs> elected officials who are, you know, I don't want to say minority, but minority. <laughs> and we, and we, can, and we, can send it, we can send it out so they can look. That could be one. Yeah, so I, I'm going to, I'm going to put the link, but please apply, look into it. Um, the assembly and the Senate, they also have an internship program, but that's only if you're upstate where you actually get to be in the legislative offices. So you get to see in real time um, all the hearings and stuff like that. I mean, you can watch them online, but I'll put them in the chat. Um, but yes, please apply to that because, you know, as CUNY, we're here in the city, um, but, you know, your elected officials are still in their districts, even though they do go to Albany, but you can still intern in district office and get that experience. Enoch, take a moment to talk about the internship program you did, and then I'll put Amanda and Aisha in, in, in to close out uh, in dialogue together about running for office. Sure, sure. yeah, I just, just to piggyback on what everyone else has said, I think just before I even go into the programs that I did, I think having a plan is, 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 is always very important, but also just being flexible and being open-minded. So um, I always wanted to do something in international relations, public health, and that has always been my trajectory. But um, I kind of went into that space. I kind of went after college, in college and after college, went in basically with an open mind. And what I, my goal was basically to be in every sector everywhere. So my in, I've done internships with uh, Wall Street firms. I have no background in finance, but uh, that was something that I was like, I, I would interest me because like we've all kind of discussed here, the whole machinery of government, every sector factors into it. So it's very, it's very important to have knowledge in, in almost every sector if that's something that you want to do. So going in with that open mind, uh, I mean, going into, I work with a, a Wall Street firm called British American Business that basically uh, networks British and American companies. That kind of gave me a whole insight into the finance world. Um, I then worked with a, a local Black organization when I was back in California called the LA Black Worker Center. Uh, basically was an organizing group that basically uh, what was the hope the purpose was to get more black uh, black people black men and women into the in, into the workforce and so seeing how organizing works uh, nonprofit work is also you know that knowledge base that I was able to garner and then I moved to an internship with the United Nations kind of bringing out the whole politics and governance on a global scale and then came back local into city government 
So definitely going in, have definitely having a plan as to what you want to do, but also like everybody has said, networking, reaching out to people, explaining yourself to people, but also keeping an open mind and seeing that all these sectors, all these areas virtually come to, no skill goes to waste. It's, it's, it's something that I have come to learn is that there's something that you might learn on one, eight, one, one sector and that you might end up applying that on another. So just keeping an open mind and, and, and reaching out to people and, and building those connections is, is, is definitely very important. Yeah. Well, right. Before I go to other thing, I want to hold on on Enoch saying what Enoch said. I've interned, I have a very natural, I dropped out of college, went to Hostos. I've had a chance to work in a nonprofit, be an educator, try to start my own tech nonprofit focused on community college students, intern, you know, uh, summer at a Venture Philanthropy, which is like an organization that invests in nonprofits to help them scale, you know, a number of different spaces and things. And I bring all of them to the table in my work. It actually makes me really competitive or not competitive. It actually bring, makes me add a lot of value because I can see the landscape and understand where things connect. And I can bring those resources to the table when sometimes sometimes other folks maybe have had a more singular trajectory. And sometimes when government too, is about if you're working for someone, it's about being indispensable, whether that's solving the constituent case or getting that information or building that relationship or finding out what's happening on the ground and bringing it back to the table, like or bringing a partner or an organization that can amplify the work you do in government. Like those things that to Enoch said, if you can, even if you have some other experiences and you end up like Jimmy, coming back, right, journalism, and other, right, those things can be brought together, right, and valuable. Um, and you can go on to work in other spaces too, right? Um, so uh, thank you, Enoch. And I, 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 if we do have a couple of minutes, I want, I want to just, we have two people who have run for office and one uh, has run who's just won and one who is running right now. Both have run twice. Both are women and we have an opportunity in 2021 across our city council when there's going to be 37 new seats available in 20, we have a new mayor in 2021, we'll have a city council. There's so many opportunities to work on campaigns and help out, but we wanna see women and women of color uh, and, and queer and gay and brown and black and Asian folks in our government, right? We wanna be a representative. And so Aisha and Amanda, can just, could you speak a little bit about why you ran? You know, what, what did you learn from running and what you, and, and, and how, and, and, and the lesson of, of fail, you guys, y'all, you lost, you both lost and ran again. So if you touch on like why you ran, what do you learn in running? And what, wh how did you dig deep to run again about, about failure and moving forward? And I'll end on that. Yeah. <laughs> so I think Amanda and I share a, a similar bond over why we ran. Um, our districts are very similar um, and for a long time lacked representation. Um, one thing that you learn in politics is that some folks don't know how to let it go and they no longer represent the, the community, right? And as folks like Amanda and I, who are born and raised in our communities, we've seen our communities long be starved of services. And uh, representation matters. You mentioned um, diversity, right? Um, and that particular lens has been missing in city and state government. So one of the reasons I ran is that I was born and raised in NYCHA and I know now everyone's talking about NYCHA, but you know, 35 years ago when I was born, nobody was talking about NYCHA, right? Like no one was talking about it. We were the forgotten buildings, right? We were the forgotten people. Um, growing up without having heat and hot water becomes like a normal life. When my grandmother used to just heat up the pot of, uh, pot of water and you're taking a bath with a cup and soap and you're like, you think this is normal. Um, so growing up and experiencing all of that, not realizing that there's a better life out there, right? That folks are supposed to, that you trust your, you trust your representatives to kind of fight for you in these levels of government. And that is something that stuck with me. And um, ironically enough, I was the student body president at also. So this is very dear and near to me. So, and, and experiencing the power of my voice as a student advocate and lobbying for capital projects like the dental hygiene program, radiology programs, all programs that have flourished. And I'm so happy to kind of see that. Um, but when you learn the power of your voice, you realize like, I wanna apply this on a local level, right? And um, I started to work with Congressman Serrano, uh, her and I have that in common. <laughs> um, we both got our start with Congressman Serrano and I'm grateful for that. But I moved on to work for several elected officials, nonprofits. And as you grow as a person, as you grow as a leader and you realize that there's so, there's so many resources and you go back home and you still see the hood looking the way it does and you're like, we want more. 
So I did something that was very unorthodox in 2016. Um, I also worked for the Democratic Party for six, seven years. And I turned around and challenged the same institution. And I challenged an incumbent. And everyone's like, you're crazy. Why would you do this? No one votes for girls like you. Um, you need more experience. How old are you? 12. Like, you know, you hear all these things. Um, and in 2016, this was pre the blue wave, um, pre Trump, right, where it activated such a, an important part of voters in, in New York City and New York State. Um, and I, I took that leap of faith because I felt that my community deserves someone that has gone to the struggles, has worked to advance from those struggles. And, and, and was a true representative of, of, of someone who, who came out of, of that hole that we, we call, right? And I took that leap of faith in 2016, potentially knowing that I could lose the race considering the powers to be were against, um, were against this campaign. And I say that we won 36% of the vote. And you know I, I, don't, I don't believe that our community lost. I think that our community now began to say, hey, we've had the same representative for 34 years. Maybe it's time we look at our options considering you know this girl was right. And I think that that was a huge step um, in my district that has never really had a primary. And I think that that's important. Um, and, and, and it awoke a, an electorate. So just to kind of sum it up, I ran because people like me were not represented. Um, we are the majority of the voters in, in my district and yet we were not represented well. And I, just to kind of continue to say that we were starved for many needed resources. I mean, it's sad to say, but there's a lawsuit in the state for campaign for fiscal equity. Our school has have not received the proper funding from the state of New York and made no mistake that we've also had the highest retention rate of members. So when you make that correlation of the highest retention of members and nothing is changing, then it's time to shake it up. You know, it's time to shake it up and get folks that have actually gone through those issues to be the representatives in this community. Um, and that was that was my why. Um, I'm doing this for my kids. I'm doing this for little Aisha that grew up in the projects and didn't see anyone coming to extend her hand and tell her, hey, here's an internship. Hey, this is college. Hey, this is financial literacy. Um, I didn't have any of that. So that that's definitely my my big why. Yeah, and I, I think I would echo a lot of that. Um, I think so much of it is linked to representation in terms of the first time I decided to run. Um, but frankly, for me, it was a lot of it was rooted also in frustration. Um, I had started in, in all of politics working with this community based organization called The Point that does a lot of work in social justice spaces. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of how I ran into the congressman's office and all this other stuff. And I think that there's this thing that happens in government and, and I urge all of you to learn this for yourself. Um, at least for me coming from government in a place like the Bronx, there is, you see people around the country that have this like watershed moment that say like my, my, my representative voted wrong on this thing, or I saw him say this, that he doesn't think whatever. And they have this one moment that kind of fired them up and got them going. And I think when you live in the South Bronx, I'm from Hunts Point originally, you, it's not this one moment, right? It's like, it's a perfect storm of a constant set of circumstances that ends up being like a slow drip. Like Aisha mentioned, you watch your schools not do well, you watch people need jobs, year after year evictions are going up and things feel like they're getting worse. And then you kind of look around at your representation and it doesn't feel like anybody's really speaking up in the ways that they should. Um, and that's what was frustrating for me working in government, being in some of these rooms and seeing that people who were meant to represent others just weren't speaking up in the ways that they that that, that I thought they should. Um, and so I think for me, it was kind of like, I had the thought a few times, like, man, I would have done that differently. Man, I would have said something more about that. Hey, I would fight more about this issue. Um, and then finally you get frustrated enough where you just jump in yourself and decide to do it. Um, and that's exactly how I ended up sort of pulling the trigger. Um, I also ran against someone who's been in office literally almost as long as I've been alive. and. It was a big decision um, and I did lose the first time and it was heartbreaking um, because you put every single thing that you've got into this race. You have so many people around you telling you that it's not the right time, that you shouldn't do it. And for all of these other reasons why you're gonna lose. Um, and it, it's devastating. Like there is, there's no other word for it. It is nothing short of devastating. But when you come out of that fog, you wake up and things are still the same, right? So Phil, you mentioned digging deep. For me, digging deep meant understanding that if I wasn't going to get in this fight, if I'm not going to wage this war, 
And if I'm not going to keep pushing, keep pushing, then what am I saying to all the people that I made that promise to, right? What am I saying about the issues that need to be worked on? And what am I saying to all of the people that I say, you know, get out there, make the change in your community. What is the message we're sending if we ourselves cannot be the brave people who are going to stand up for our own communities? Um, and so it it is, I'll tell you, it is very scary um, because it's, Every single person you know, every contact that you've built, every bit of political capital that you spend your career building, all on the line at once. Um, but you also, I think, what's fortifying for me is always to remember that like, it's also my community and the things that they need, right? It's people like being able to stay in their homes or not. It's people being having access to food or not. It's kids learning how to read in first grade or not, right? Like those are really heavy consequential issues um, that follow people throughout their lives. And so um, it, was a, it was a grueling, gory process, but I'm really glad we got through it. And I'm happy to talk to anyone who's interested in, in running for office. And I wanna also highlight that um, there are so many other ways to be impactful in government as well. Um, if, you're not, if you don't feel like you wanna be so out front or so out there or so open to criticism, um, I get some mean tweets sometimes and it sucks, right? If you, if you don't want to deal with those things, there are a lot of other ways. There's so many great people on these panels, a lot of other ways to impact government. Um, and I think a lot of times people think about government and politics as simultaneous um, or as, as synchronous and they're not. You can, you can certainly be in one realm or the other and have just as much impact. Um, I, I think it's amazing one because we, we are, you all have time, but we are, these panelists have given a couple extra minutes and I think these are just really a tremendous opportunities to learn. So I thank all the panelists for staying for a couple extra minutes. Um, and I want, I want to hold on a couple uh, two or three things. I think it's in dialogue. I'm hoping we can have a part two, Jason, because we can have this more conversation that be, can be had here. Um, but I just want to hold on a couple of these themes, right? Amanda's got a thinking on these themes throughout this panel. I want to tease them out. We've teased them out for you all. And um, one is both of, you know, what we, one, when women get elected, right, women's issues are everybody's issues, right? That, that's what we have to also center here and why we have these two women who are, who have run and run and it, and they lost. I think I worked for somebody before I went, before I got into Tufts after Hostos, but right when I was at Hostos, I, I, I worked on a campaign that lost and losing sucks. Um, but it, sometimes it's like necessary. It happens. And like you said, and she uh, was the, is the founder of Girls Who Code. She was running for public advocate. And I heard her say, and she, she talks about women running and leading and taking risks and so forth, that, you know, there were a lot of men who, you know, oh, wait your turn, wait your time, um, you know, people who are dismissing you. And it might, that could also be age, older people telling you, wait your time. It could be a number of people who tell, the gatekeepers to access to power or so forth, right? But you got to, no, absolutely agree. You got to, I think you have to, you got to, it's a risk. Uh, Aisha and Amanda put themselves out there publicly. They could have failed. Uh, people could have made fun of them. They they weren't so scared. They thought the, the, the purpose was greater and the opportunity was greater to put themselves out there. And the fear of failure didn't stop them, even a second time. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's really important. We think about whatever in your life, that's a really important theme in life to take a chance and believe in yourself. You and in your community. To quickly respond to that. I think I wanted to also mention the, the point about gatekeepers. Um, I'm 29 now for the last few years, the, the message had always been that I'm just too young, that I need to wait and maybe that I don't know enough and that I need to learn more. And I think what I always want everyone here to understand is that like you are the expert of your life. There is no better teacher on policy. You can't learn it in school. There's no better teacher than lived experience. So if you're experiencing issues day to day in your community, there's no one who's gonna know better about that than you. And that's what gatekeepers lose sight of. People who tell you that, it, that it's not been enough time, that you're too young, that you have to learn more, are totally discounting your lived experience, which is the most valuable thing that you can bring into some of these rooms because so many parts of government are missing the diversity in thought, diversity period, but also diversity in experience. We need people who don't come from the traditional halls of power, if you want to call them that. And we need people to bring these experiences in. And sometimes that means having to beat the door down to do that, but it is so, so worth it because that's the only way that these stories from the regular block in our community get hurt. It's when we're fighting to make sure that they're in the room. Right, Taking not taking no for an answer, or if someone doesn't email you back, if you reach out to them, email them again. Maybe it's the next person, you know, if they say no to this internship, maybe it's the next internship. Maybe you show up and have a conversation. 
if you are a first generation student, you from Jamaica, you from Mexico, you from South Central America, these are all valued experiences. Don't let anyone tell you that your experiences and your, your, your family members, the things you've learned, the languages you bring to the table. When we're having a pandemic, we didn't get to talk about this, but I hope we can talk, do a second. We're gonna be in the pandemic for a while, maybe a second about the government during a pandemic would be a good one and talking in a conversation. But these, these experiences are really needed when we try to connect to say, to elevate, to figure out what's going on in these communities, how do we help them? And so someone, some people like yourselves could really add a lot of value, um, right? And uh, there's a lot of people here. And so I round out, I don't know if there's time for one question. Is there any like one question? Does anyone have one burning question they wanted to ask any specific person or, or so forth um, before we head out here? All good if we don't, just wait, just wondering if I, I know some people put something in there. Do we see anything from there? I'm just scrolling to see. I know there was good engagement. We answered all the questions. I think we did. We had robust. Um, <laughs> so I'll, I'll just close out. Um, I'll close out here. Um, and there was, uh, I, I actually was wanting to say quickly how I got started. Um, I worked in education, kind of like Jordan and I met we, but I just had done city year in the Bronx and Hunts Point. I spent a year in the Hunts Point working with students and communities in the Point, which is an amazing community center, the most dynamic place. I've not been back and I need to go back. Uh, Amanda talked about it. It's in her district, Hunts Point, the Point. And I spent time there in a school, PS48, and in the Point. And after that, you know, it was Obama inspired a lot of the, the younger millennials, et cetera. I actually was around politics. My dad was, my dad used to engage the Dinkins administration, but I didn't care, didn't think about it. He was an entrepreneur. But after I did city year, I realized that you know there was a race for Congress and nobody to nobody knew about it, and and people did know Charlie Rangel, but no one knew the other candidates, and it wasn't enough conversation. So I, I, I and one of my other best friends who is a teacher and dean, uh, I just said, hey man, let's get a couple of friends together and let's you know let's try to let's go to a local Harlem business and let's see if we can get a deal, maybe a happy hour or some food on discount so we can bring these candidates and get people to come and just have a forum to ask them questions. I wasn't raising money for anybody. I wasn't getting paid for this. I just, that was something that I was moved by to help people learn just like in this opportunity to talk to you all. And um, that's how I got and started to get involved before I did internships and fundraising and all these kind of things. So just, just that. And so I close with saying this, thank you to Jason. Um, I see you Professor, Professor Hoyland. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you to um, the students. Uh, we're gonna, I think we should do a part two here. I, I, I hope we didn't do too much talking to you. We didn't get to talk about Black Lives Matters and, and redefining public safety and some other things I think would've been interesting. Um, but I hope we do number two. I think what I also hope is that I saw some of you active advocating for yourself, telling Amanda, I need to get this internship. And that's what we wanna see. Or if you're in Harlem, reach out to Mina or Jordan. These people are now part of your hostos family. I hope that you can reach out to them and we can share information and you can sit down with them virtually. Ask, ask Jordan Stockdale in the mayor's office for 20 minutes of his time via email or Jimmy. And these are all people from the Bronx or have gone to Hostos or CUNY or gone to other places, but they're here to help. And I also wanna say that there's an, a tradition of excellence here at Hostos in the Student Leadership Academy. Um, people don't recognize the CUNY used to be very white and Jewish because they would not let the Ivy League, the Harvards, the places the other places have gone to, Princeton, like Jordan went to, they did not let other people of color and so forth go there. And so CUNY at some point in time um, began to change. We began to have more folks. And in the 70s, I believe in the 70s or 80s, you know, Hostos is the South Bronx, hip hop, Black and Latino people made a global culture in the backyard of Hostos. And when they wanted to shut down Hostos, it was Black and Latino people who protested, who fought to make sure that they could keep Hostos, you got to fight for what you want, whether that's in your life or for your community or for an opportunity. And let, let that not be forgotten that that's the tradition of Hostos and the context that's there. So I end, I thank you for your time. Uh, I look forward to talking to you some more and uh, I'm down to be helpful in any way that I can. Thank you to all the panelists. I really appreciate all the love that you put into sharing nuggets and, um, and hope. Uh, thank you, Jason. I just want to say thank you uh, to everybody. Uh, it's really a privilege to have you here with us. We do this every Friday from 3.30 to 5.30 during the fall and the spring, and we do some special ones in the winter, which we're going to do again this year virtually. Uh, this has sort of been uh, a challenge for us, but we still come together because we want to continue to uh, engage the students who have leadership 
um, goals and dreams and desires. And um, so I want to I want to thank first by saying thanks to Aisha, uh, one of our, our our wonderful graduates of Postal Community College, and I've known her for a very long time. She's always been supportive of everything that we do. Uh, Amanda, uh, congratulations. Um, we look forward to all the changes that you're going to make uh, for Hostos and the community. Uh, and we're engaged in the community. So I feel they mentioned this, but we do, when we are normal uh, and not COVID struck, we do 52 volunteer projects in the community. So we like to get out there and put our hands down and help people out. So we look forward to seeing the, the great work that you're going to do. Uh, Mina, I uh, thank you for being here. Really appreciate your contribution. Jimmy, uh, awesome hostels graduate. Happy to see you uh, doing so well. Uh, Jordan, uh, send our regards to the mayor. Uh, tell, tell him he can stop by anytime uh, when COVID's not going on. Uh, and then let me say a special thank you to, to my, my two very good friends. Um, Enoch, uh, we love you. Uh, we miss you. Uh, you are great uh, pride and joy of not only ASAP and Hostos, but especially the Leadership Academy. Uh, we miss you and we wish you extraordinary success on your journey. And Phil, uh, I could not have done this by myself. Uh, you are the first one in the long legacy of the Leadership Academy to actually pull something like this off. Uh, I am so happy that you did this. Uh, all of the comments in the chat and through text message to me throughout this entire session have been extremely positive. I think even if uh, people didn't ask questions, uh, you've made an incredible contribution uh, to our group. And I'm glad to see that the professors are here, Professor Chang and Professor Hoyland. And we're, we've recorded this, so we are going to share it on our, on our YouTube page and our Facebook page. And so students can have the benefit of hearing these things uh, as well. So, and Phil, you know, I mean, Phil, do, Phil doesn't take enough credit for some of the stuff that he does. I mean, he was a big part of our Black Lives Matter conversation that we had uh, when we had brought back 70 graduates in, uh, uh, in the summer to talk about everything. Um, he also gathered up a group of hostess alumni to go and help out get out the vote uh, for Joe Biden. Uh, they went to Pennsylvania and knocked on doors and told people, you know, you got to vote. Uh, he's an extraordinary leader. Uh, he has extraordinary relationships um, and his friends will preach uh, his, his wonder, wonderful qualities a lot better than I can. Uh, but I know that a lot of people sent me messages today that they wanted to be here. Uh, and some people stopped by and had to get out uh, just to see Phil and just to show their support for him. So Phil, thank you so much. Um, thank you for doing this. Thank you for bringing this together. Everybody, I, I really appreciate your contributions. Uh, you are always welcome at the Hostel Student Leadership Academy. Uh, I don't have to tell you, you are always welcome at Hostel Community College uh, because you are, you are a part of our family. And I, I truly wish you the best in, in all that you're doing. And I hope that all of you who were here today really took something from this. Uh, this was a really, really special event. Uh, and you got to hear from some extraordinary individuals who are not unlike yourselves. And so my expectation is this is only the first step of your journey to go to the next level, uh, just like everybody else uh, who's on our panel and everybody else who's come before you as part of our program. Uh, I, just wanted, I just wanted to say one thing, Jason. Um, what, uh, uh, the two things is also a big part of my start was that Jason would take students up to uh, Albany at, at caucus weekend. When there's a caucus weekend, he would take students up and that's when you get to see and meet people. So if you're looking for internships and you want to meet electeds, Jason has helped folks go up there before. The president, tell the president of Hostos to make sure y'all have the funding to go up there. Advocate for it, right? And I just end with saying Jason has been doing this for years. Jason is a valuable treasure to everyone. And you all have to, we don't always appreciate Jason in the way that he needs to be appreciated. Even if he's given you an attitude one day because he's mad about something. But usually he's mad about something because he's been fighting for you all. So I, I just thank you, Jason, and I want to take a moment. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, panelists. I know we went so much over it. Thank you, Enoch. Much love to all the panelists. Uh, proud of host host. Remember the tradition, y'all. Thank you all. Happy Friday, everybody. Thank you guys for being here. Be safe out there. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Stay safe. I'll give you my email. Or do Jason, you can give my email. I'll just show up to my email. 
Bye, everybody. Have a good weekend. Uh, Let me know if you need anything, folks. Bye-bye. We'll do another meeting for all the announcements. Okay. We'll do we'll do it. We'll do a second. We'll do a second meeting, Jason, at some point. We'll come up with a second one. All right. Government. Yeah, let's do it. Government after 101. We'll figure it out. <laughs> 102. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Bye. Jason. Thank you. Bye, Roxanne. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Bye, everyone. Bye, boss. Bye. Stefan, did you check your email this week?